Whoops, we'll get that fixed. Just give us a couple of seconds. <laughs> I could try to make up what he's saying and ad limit. Yeah. Hey everyone, I'm Alex, Video Productions Director here at Christ United. Welcome, thank you for joining us. As usual, I have a few quick announcements to share before we get our services started today. Here at Christ United, we believe prayer is powerful and that vibrant communities are built by loving and encouraging one another. And we need your help in showing our students just how much they mean to us. Starting Sunday, August 8th, we welcome you to our table in the atrium to pick up a cross with a student's name or fill out a form where we will match families with students as a reminder to pray for them throughout the year. If you have any questions, please reach out to Reverend Paige Christian at page at cumc.com. If you are excited for Camp Big Church, it's been moved to Sunday, September 12th, same time, 2 to 3.30 p.m. If you don't know what Camp Big Church is, it's an afternoon meant for students and parents to learn the importance of being in worship. Children will be led by Meredith McBride in the sanctuary and modern worship space to learn the ins and outs of coming to worship. Be sure to register at cumc.com slash bigchurch. If you have any questions regarding service, please reach out to one of our volunteers in the lobby, or if you're online, please send an email to cumc at cumc.com. Thank you again for joining us this morning. We hope that you all have an amazing day. Oh, Kristen. Oh, okay. hey. So glad you're here. Yeah, okay. you told me to come here. Yeah. You said you had this really great idea. Yeah, it's, yeah. it is great, so no is quotes. It? No okay. quotes? I no thought quotes. you were just the pastor of like, Good ideas, though. Oh, no. I'm great now. Oh, oh okay. Good. I've elevated. I'm glad we can okay. promote ourselves. So I was thinking, okay. what if we had a Ready. women's, like, day retreat? So, uh, like... What? Yeah. So I was thinking, like, it's been a really hard year. Yeah. Let's get them together. Yeah. Uh, we could have, like, worship. We could have, like, breakout groups. And then, like, they could learn about, like, mission opportunities and how to get plugged in. And break, small break it, groups. break it, break it. Hold on. Like, like a women's event. Yes. That we do yes. one day and we like yes. invite everyone. Yes. I have amazing news for you. Okay. You know, all those meetings you've been just declining since you've been on vacation. Uh, yeah. We have put one together. Look at this. Oh. Yeah. That so, looks pretty. Yeah. So we're doing one on August 21st. That's so Okay. That wasn't what you were thinking? I was thinking this weekend. Oh, okay. No, nope. it is actually taking us months to plan. We're like super pumped about it. Oh, so okay. do you do you think you could get on board with this one though? I, I, we're going to okay. have a speaker. Her name is Dr. Kelly Jamison. She's going to come talk about self-care. Okay. Uh, we were really hoping that you would give us a fun and encouraging message. Um, I'll try. Okay, so we hope that you guys will actually come to the event. It's on August 21st. It's called Refresh, Ooh. and it's from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And guess what? 
childcare is included. And so if you've got your kiddos, bring them along. It's $60 for the whole event for the whole day. So we're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be great. Yeah. So at, yes. sign up. Sign up at cumc.com forward slash refresh, or you can grab one of these flyers. And we've got these fancy QR codes that I know Don told you all about. Yep. So you can use that to get all signed up. And we hope to see you there. Good morning. Mason and I were just laughing because you can tell that that video was made several weeks ago whenever Reagan says, well, I was thinking it being this weekend. It's like, oh, it actually is this weekend now. So if you're not doing anything on Saturday, we'd love to have you at the women's event. We're so excited that you're here joining us in worship today. Let's stand and sing together. Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me from the ashes, broken and the curse. Blessed Redeemer, you set this captive. Lord, I can't help.
joining Christ United. I am Reverend Stephanie Reed Meyer, pastor of our modern service. We are so glad you are here. If you can't tell, we always want this to be a family-friendly service. For our littles, if they have wiggles, if they want to dance, if they want to sit during the song, all are welcome here. You are loved, you are appreciated. However you worship this morning, we are glad you are part of this family. If you're with us online, we feel your presence. We are glad you are with us. Be sure to check in however you are watching. Here, for those of us in person, there is a QR code on your bulletin. If you're not into QR codes, you can still register your attendance. Don't fret. In the seat back in front of you, or if you're on the front row on your chair, there's actually a paper attendance form that you can complete. If you're a member or you've been here a lot of times, we don't need your address every single time. Just jot down your name. We'll know it's you. Today is such an exciting Sunday. It is third grade Bible presentation. So if you are a third grader, you are getting a Bible today. Even if you didn't register, come on up. We are giving you one. So we are going to do third grade Bible at the end of the service because our children's ministry team is doing it at the beginning of traditional service, and then they're going to make their way over here. So third graders, don't get antsy. We're not going to forget about you. It's just going to be a little later in the service. We are continuing a sermon series on Abraham and Sarah this morning. And so as we enter and continue on in worship, I invite you to join me in a morning prayer. Generous God, you gave us our voices, no two the same. As you did with Abraham and Sarah, you take and touch our lives, and they can become extraordinary. And in your church, you have gathered us. In your community of common folk and complainers, prophets and puzzled people, you have called us and made a place for us. So let what we say and do here what we ponder and decide here, be real for us and honest to you as you prepare us for the life of the world in which you are praised. Amen. Let's continue in worship together. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Run dry, never run dry. No, no, you never run dry, never run dry, never run dry. No, no, you never run dry, never run dry, never run dry. No, no, you never run dry, never run dry, never run dry. No, no, you never run dry, never run dry, never run dry. No, no, you never run dry,
never run dry, never run dry. You never run dry, never run dry, never run dry. You're my source, you never ending. You're my light, you're never lacking. You're my source. and of all the things that have gone on, the countless wars and the countless struggles, the countless um, hardships that even the most blessed of us go through. It's so easy sometimes to look past when we're waiting for something good to happen and it's not coming. It's so easy to look past the last blessing we have. It's so easy, God, to, to look away from all of the wonderful love that you throw in our direction. But here, God, in the midst uh, of a resurgence of COVID and in the midst of the trials of life, going back to school and being busy and not having time for this and not having strength for that and not having energy for this. God, in the midst of all of the turmoil and the craziness, please just help us remember that you absolutely do not run dry. That at any given point in our entire lives, all we have to do is reach out to the well. And there is plenty of living water to go around. So as we move through this service here today, God, I ask that you come and be a part of our mindsets. I ask that you come and be a part of our thoughts as we seek to grow a little bit closer to you, to tap into a little bit more of that living water. Because God... It solves all of these problems that we have inside our hearts when we focus on your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It is great energy in this place. I'm telling you, any place I am that has all the kids, I'm there. So much fun. We are continuing our sermon series today, and last week we talked a ton about Abraham, how Abraham put his trust in God, 
and still found courage to ask God for clarification or when he needed a little bit more reassurance from God. Abraham and Sarah are main characters of this sermon series and our focus in Genesis. They have been promised a legacy. They've been promised descendants, as many descendants as stars in the sky, which typically you can't count, but you can probably count the ones behind me. Let's use the picture for as many stars in the sky as our image. They've been made all of these promises for not only descendants, but also for wealth and for land. They are called in return to listen to God and to make God their God. Having a child of their own, though, is a really big part of the promise. It's something that Abraham and Sarah are yearning for. Having children, especially a boy, is not only important for Abraham and Sarah, but it's really important for this culture at the time. But before we go any further, I do want to give a trigger warning. I know that talking about the importance of Abraham and Sarah having a child of their own can be triggering to some of us. People who have experienced that yearning for a child and instead have faced heartbreak or disappointment and what often feels like unanswered prayers. As we continue with this series, specifically today and next week, I want to hold space for each of us. While Abraham and Sarah get their happy ending of a child, we know that it isn't always so in our own lives. Or we may not know the end of our story yet, which can be difficult. If you need to tune out parts of this sermon or go get coffee in the middle of it, I want to support you and encourage you to do so. And I want to invite anyone who may be listening this morning to not hesitate to reach out to me if you find that you need a safe space to process. I, too, know that yearning and heartbreak. And I want you all to know that you are not alone in this journey. Our scripture reading today, though, doesn't start right away with the promise of a child. Instead, it begins with a story on hospitality. We are going to begin there in Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Hear these words from the author of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham at the oaks of Mamre while he sat at the entrance of his tent in the day's heat. He looked up and suddenly saw three men standing near him. As soon as Abraham saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to greet them, and he bowed deeply. He said, sirs, if you would be so kind, don't just pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought so you may wash your feet and refresh yourselves under the tree. Let me offer you a little bread so you will feel stronger. And after that, you may leave your servant and go on your way since you've visited your servant. They responded, fine, do just as you said. So Abraham hurried to Sarah at his tent and said, hurry, knead three seahs of the finest flour and make some baked goods. Abraham ran to the cattle, took a healthy young calf, gave it to a young servant who he asked to prepare it quickly. Then Abraham took butter, milk, and the calf that had been prepared, put the food in front of them, and stood under the tree near them as they ate. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let the church say, thanks be to God. Uh, this scene right here gives me a lot of anxiety. It was for sure a normal part of the culture back then to have unexpected visitors. It was also really normal to invite them into your home or to your area and to offer them a place to rest and refuel along their journey. I don't know about you, but this is not the kind of lifestyle for me. I need to know who is coming over, how long they're staying. I need to have an idea of the schedule of things we're going to do while they're there. 
And I also want whoever's coming over to know that I need them to leave by a certain time. Bed and rest are very important to me. I like order. I like to have a plan. Abraham seems to be much better at this last-minute hospitality than I am. It's part of their culture, after all. He sees these men, one of whom we're led to believe is actually God, depending on what translation of Scripture you read. And Abraham sees them and immediately invites them to rest. And he offers them a little water and a little bread. However, after Abraham welcomes them, he runs to the tent to find his wife, Sarah. And that's where we see Abraham show a little bit of what I'm calling his Stephanie sighed. Genesis tells us that he hurries to Sarah and that he actually says, hurry, Sarah, need this bread. And then he runs off to get a cattle. That's a lot of rushing. Nothing about this is demonstrating a calm, collected person who's used to randos showing up at his door. What Abraham calls a little water and a little bread turn out to be fresh bread, butter, milk, a calf. That is radical hospitality, no matter the hurried manner in which it occurs. I like the fact that Abraham kind of sets the bar low and then goes above and beyond in surpassing it. It's impressive. As a side note, if you're into biblical literature, there is a lot of implication here about where this story sits in relation to another story that's coming up, the destruction of Sodom, which is in this exact same chapter. Lot, the nephew of Abraham, ends up offering a very similar radical hospitality to these same people in Sodom but they have a much different ending than this scene with Abraham. I encourage you to read the surrounding stories if you want more on that. That would be a third sermon today, uh, and that's a lot for us. Let's focus on what I have for us now. We're going to stick with the hospitality scene. Before I was ever appointed at a local church, I was blessed with a season of life where I could visit different congregations, different churches. I really, really enjoy visiting other United Methodist churches because it exposes me to how other people do ministry. And something that always caught my attention at every single church I visited was their hospitality. At some churches I would visit, I was able to kind of fly under the radar because there was really no way to know it was my first time. And personally, between you and I, that's uh, my favorite way to receive hospitality, just to kind of be. One time, a church invited first-time visitors out in the congregation that I was sitting in that they could stand, and if they stood, they would receive a loaf of homemade bread. I hate standing up in those situations, but I would do anything for some carbs. So I stood up. At another church, I thought I'd flown under the radar. And so after the service, I went to lunch and went home to take my Sunday afternoon nap. And as I arrived at my apartment, there was a coffee cup and a welcome letter from the church I had just visited which is a little creepy. I did write all that information down. It's not like they stalked me or followed me, but still, it was a little jarring to see at my front door. But for some people, it was probably a really big act of radical hospitality that meant a lot to them. There's a lot of ways to offer hospitality. And honestly, each of us probably have our own preference as to how we receive hospitality from others. For me, the most important aspect of hospitality is that it's offered to everyone, to all people, to every single one of us. Yes, we may need to adapt it depending on the person and what works best for them, but we should never withhold hospitality from someone else for any reason at all. 
Our hospitality, our welcomeness should be for all people. It's part of Jesus' whole love your neighbor thing. Jesus didn't mean to only love some people, the ones who are cool or the ones you happen to get along with, or maybe the ones who are most like you. We're called to love our neighbors. I'm confident Jesus means everyone, all people, when he says that thing about loving neighbors. Abraham's interaction with these randos, with these guests outside of his tent, reminds us that we too can offer hospitality to even those who are strangers. Let's keep reading about their encounter. It's going to get a little juicy. Here we go, chapter 18. Let's look at the immediately following verses, 9 through 15. Hear these words. They said to him, They, being the group of visitors, said to Abraham, where's your wife Sarah? And Abraham said, right here in the tent. Then one of the men said, I will definitely return to you about this time next year. Then your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were both very old. Sarah was no longer menstruating, so Sarah laughed to herself, thinking, I'm no longer able to have children, and my husband's old. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, me give birth at my age? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? When I return to you about this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Sarah lied and said, I didn't laugh because she was frightened. But God said, no, you laughed. First things first, we don't know quite the intonation that God used when God said, no, you laughed. It sounds kind of harsh when we read it aloud. It sounds kind of like God is calling Sarah out for her laughter. We know that God doesn't punish Sarah for her doubt, that God does not revoke this covenant that he's already made, but it's interesting that this bit is even included in our scripture, and I'll tell you why. Chapter 17, the chapter right before what we just read, God renames Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah. And God reiterates directly to Abraham that Sarah is the one who will have his son, even though Hagar has already given Abraham a son, a son named Ishmael. So in chapter 17, before Sarah laughs, a very similar scene happens right before, and it's with Abraham and God. Okay, we need to all read this so we're on the same page. Chapter 17, let's read verses uh, 9 through 15. Is that what I gave you? Huh. Nope. Abraham 17, 9 through 15. You know what? Let's scratch that. I'm going to read it to you. We can pay attention to reading without seeing something. Yes, totally. Let's go. God said to Abram, Abraham now, As for you, you must keep my covenant. You, oh, this is about circumcision. Whoa, we don't want to talk about that. (laughs) Let's pause. Okay, I was right. We're starting in, uh, (laughs) you guys, the tech team hates me today. Okay, Genesis 17, we're going to look at 15 through 19. Y'all may be able to read along. Also, there's a whole circumcision thing. Again, if you want to read about it, feel free, chapter 17. I empower you. Oh, no, this is still not right. Okay, listen to me. Chapter 17, verses 15. I promise if this is your first time, this is a super normal. Okay, God said to Abraham, as for your wife Sarai, you will no longer call her Sarai. Her name will now be Sarah. I will bless her and even give you a son from her. I will bless her so that she will become nations and kings of peoples will come from her. Okay, this is where I need everyone to listen. Abram fell on his face and laughed. He said to himself, can a 100-year-old man become a father or a 99-year-old woman have a child? To God, Abraham said, 
if only you would accept Ishmael. But God said, no, your wife Sarah will give birth to a son for you, and you will name him Isaac. I will set up my covenant with him and with his descendants after him as an enduring covenant. God goes on to talk about how he's going to bless not only Isaac, but he's also going to offer blessings to Ishmael. But I want us to focus on the fact that before Sarah laughs, Abraham laughs. And Abraham isn't called out for it. God just kind of seems to brush it off and continue on. When we read these stories in the Old Testament, we have to remember the cultural slant that is on them, one that often favors men. Sarah often takes the blame for laughing, that she has less faith or less confidence in God because she laughs. But when we look at scripture, we see that she's not the only one who laughs. Abraham laughs even before she does. Women are frequently throughout especially the Old Testament, but also the New Testament, used as objects and pawns in a much larger picture. Even here in this passage we just read, we see Abraham seemingly willing to disregard Sarah's part of the covenant. Abraham actually says to God, if only you would accept Ishmael, the son he's had with Hagar. He seems fine with the covenant being fulfilled through Ishmael. As we look forward to our scripture reading next week that deals with an interaction specifically with Sarah and Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, it's important to remember that these women are much more faceted than they seem. Here in particular, Sarah's laughter is probably full of a heaviness. It's heavy with disbelief that God is still saying this covenant is going to happen through her, an old woman. It's heavy with raw emotion from decades of trying to conceive and being disappointed every time. Sarah has probably held the burden of being responsible for not being able to bear a child, especially after Abraham ends up having a child with Hagar. Like we don't know God's intonation earlier, we also don't know what Sarah's laugh meant. What if today, this morning, we entertain the idea that, yeah, Sarah's laughter probably had to do with a little bit of disbelief, but what if there was also a hint of hope in her laughter? Laughter has the power to bring hope to the world. As a pastor, I often spend time with families in moments of really high highs and really low lows. I've done a number of weddings and funerals. And in both instances, I've witnessed firsthand the hope that laughter can bring. When I officiate weddings, I always strive to make the couple feel comfortable and for the congregation to feel, to truly feel the radiating joy of the couple. It should always be fun. Wedding ceremonies are a joyous time. Laughter is a must, even in a ceremony. And it may sound weird for me to say this to you, but when I meet with families before a funeral, when I talk to them about their stories and their remembrances, there's often a whole lot of laughter as the family remembers their loved one and their happy moments together. I've even been to a number of funerals where a funny story was shared in the service and it brought together everyone who was grieving. Laughter has a way of lightening our burdens, of reminding us that hope is still there. Hope exists in every moment. 
I mentioned earlier that <laughs> if I talked about the story of Sodom, I would be giving you three sermons. And the reason I said that is because sitting here now, you may be thinking, okay, Stephanie, you gave us a sermon about hospitality and a sermon about laughter. And you're right, I may have sneaked in two sermons this morning. But if you really need me to connect the two, it's not much of a stretch. I think it's obvious that in both hospitality and in laughter, joy is shared with others. Neither hospitality or laughter are uncomplicated. They can be complicated things. They can be multifaceted. But they're two things that have the power to bring us together as a community in happy moments and in hard moments. As followers of Jesus, it's important for us to love our neighbors joyfully. While Abraham and Sarah's story is complicated, today they teach us both a little bit more about hospitality and laughter and how we can bring joy to the world through those two things. May we embody both radical hospitality and hopeful laughter today and every day. Will you pray with me? God, we come to you this morning with the weight of the world. There is stuff happening from earthquakes to government changes, and it's hard to not feel shook up by all of it. God, in those moments of overwhelming fear and doubt and questions, we ask that you remind us of your presence, that you feel our homes, our families, our lives with laughter and hospitality. We know you are the true bringer of joy and that even when we laugh in disbelief, God, you can redeem that moment. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together this morning. We thank you for the ways you work in each of our lives amidst the laughter and amidst the pain. God, we lift up those pains of our hearts to you this morning, moments in our lives where we feel overwhelmed and in need of you. You know what's on our hearts, and today we offer that to you. God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship together and for the opportunity to come together as a people of faith, as a people who claim you as Christ, as together we proclaim the prayer taught to us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, we have the opportunity to give together. I shared last week that for the next, today's the second week, so for the next seven weeks, we are going to focus on a different ministry of the church. With third grade Bible presentation, it makes sense that our focus this morning is going to be on children's ministry. During this video, we hope you'll watch and learn a little bit about what it's like to be in the children's ministry program here at Christ United. If you want to give to us uh, financially this morning, you can do so by visiting cumc.com slash give. We will also have offering baskets passed during our offertory song. We just want to say thank you. Thank you for the ways you love and support this congregation. Let's give together as we watch this video. It is no understatement to say that the past year or so has been trying at best. 
In children's ministries, we have had to recreate, reinvent, rethink everything we do from Sunday school to our special events. But through all of our changes and our pivots, our focus has remained ensuring that every child who comes to this church, whether in person or virtually, knows that they are a beloved child of God. And while at the time we may have been more than a little bit disappointed that we had to change the way we had been planning to do things, I can honestly say that I will look back with so much fondness and more than a little bit of pride in this team and in this church for all that we were able to accomplish. From hand delivering nearly 40 third grade Bibles to our Lenten geocaching journey to a socially distanced Easter egg scavenger hunt to our first ever evening family VBS, the love and support that we have received from the church, the congregation, and our volunteers has been overwhelming. And while we will look back fondly on all that we were able to do in such a difficult time, I am so excited for all that we are going to do this year. I'm talking Camp Bible at Camp Bridgeport, created by God, in-person children's time, and so much more. We are so excited for an awesome year coming up, and we can't wait to be a part of it with you. If serving with children is your passion, we would love to have you as a member of our team. We have volunteer opportunities that run the gamut from more behind the scenes, support roles, to on the ground with the kids. We would love to get you plugged in. Find any of us and we will work on that with you. I'm not going to lie, we're a lot of fun to work with. Again, from your children's ministry team, thank you for all of the love and support and encouragement that you continue to give us. We are so excited for another wonderful year serving with you, the children of God.
like to invite our third graders who are getting Bibles this morning forward. I don't see Miss Meredith yet, but she'll make her way here. I'm convinced of it. So third graders, if you will grab your families with you, and you are all going to come up here, I'm going to spread you out. I know you're out there. I've talked to you. I've seen you. Here we go. Okay, Allen family, y'all can stand right here. Blake family, if y'all just want to stand together right in front of your seats. Barry and so y'all can be right here. And then Johnston, y'all can be right here. Perfect. I think Miss Meredith has something she's going to say for us, and I'm going to get her a microphone because we are professionals. This is a morning. Good morning, everyone. This is a very, very special day in the life of the church, and I'm so excited to be here. So today we celebrate a very special event, the presentation of our Bibles to our third graders. The Bible is a very special book because it holds our church history. It holds the story of God and of the people who loved and followed God. Your church family here is pleased to present you our children with these Bibles. We believe that you are important members of our church and it is our hope that you will use your Bible regularly and you will ask questions and seek help until you find understanding and answers. All right. We are going to first present a third grade Bible to Ellie Johnston. Congratulations. Congratulations, Yay. Ellie. Yeah. Then we are going to give a Bible to Gray Barrientos. Congratulations. Congratulations, Gray. And then we have another Bible for Ben Allen. Congratulations. Congratulations, Ben. And then we have a final Bible for Claire Blake. Congratulations, Claire. What's oh, heavy. Perfect. And then because we are all a family, but specifically these families up here with our third grade students, parents, family who are standing here, I have a question for all of you. It's real easy. All you have to do is say, we will at the end, okay? Here we go. We have a special ask for our parents and sponsors this morning. Will you assist these children, guiding and encouraging them in the study of God's word and sharing your understanding of the story of faith? If so, your answer is, we will. Perfect. And now, congregation, you're not getting off the hook. I have something for all of us to say together. Would the congregation join me in making our statement of support to these children? We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you, your family, and us as you use this Bible in your home, in Sunday school, and in worship. We will continue to love and support you as we learn together and grow with God. Will you help me in congratulating these students as they take their seats? Y'all are good. Y'all can grab your seat. And y'all can sit down. Thank y'all. Congratulations, everyone. 
And I'm going to do the benediction from the floor because I'm already out of breath and you don't want me running up the stage. As we leave this place and re-enter the world, may we be hospitable to those around us. May we laugh generously full of hope and may we bring joy to the world. Go forth strengthened and renewed. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing this last song together. Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you